going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bible or a Bible app and turn to the book of Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20 is our text. If you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that is perfectly fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you, turn to page 72, and you will find Exodus 20. Be able to follow along in our very short text uh, today. And, and as always, if you're here and you don't have a Bible, then we want you to take one of these Bibles with you. It is our gift to you. Uh, if you're at Sweetwater Campus or McCulloch Campus, then they're in the seats around you. If you're at our Parker Campus, they're in, at a table in the back, and we mean it when we say take one with you. If you read the Word of God and you need a Bible to do that, it, then take it and read it, because we know if you do that, God will change your life. Hey, while you're getting settled and finding Exodus 20, I'm going to take a moment of privilege and do a little bit of self-promotion. Well, it's not really self-promotion, it's Calvary promotion, but I, I'm involved in it. Hey, uh, here at Calvary, when you start coming, we've, we've got kind of a series of classes that we want you to take. And you know, the first one's Intro to Calvary class, kind of tells you who we are, what we believe. Uh, it's kind of the pathway to membership. Second class is an equip class, and uh, it's about serving and why we serve and how we serve here at Calvary. And, and, and those are offered monthly. And then we also offer then an ethos class. Ethos is the Greek word for culture, and, and it tells you about Calvary and who we are and why we do what we do. It kind of digs down deep, and, uh, and we only offer that about once a quarter. And, and this coming Saturday at 9 o'clock here at Sweetwater, we're offering the ethos class, and I'm telling you about that because ethos is a class we want everyone to take, especially if you're interested in leading or understanding who we are at a deeper level. And, uh, and I'm self-promoting because this coming Saturday, I get to teach ethos. Now, I wrote the material years ago, and, and so uh, my fingerprints are always on that class, but I stopped teaching it on a regular basis uh, a while ago, back, and uh, this coming weekend, I get to teach it. And so if you've been thinking about coming to ethos, you've been thinking about taking it, you're going, I really want to know, then I'm just a, a self-serving way inviting you to come and join us Saturday morning, 9 o'clock. It's going to take the whole morning. It, it's not a short class, not easy. You know, we're going to dive deep. And uh, just, you can register online, you can call the church office, let us know you're coming, because we want to have enough, have enough donuts for you, uh, and, uh, and do all that. So that's just my self-promotion. I hope you'll come and join us for Ethos this coming Saturday. Hey, we're continuing our series on the Ten Commandments. Uh, do you guys know them yet? I mean, we're kind of getting into them a little bit, and, and uh, we, we've been talking about them for six weeks prior, and every week I, that I've been sharing, I've been saying, hey, uh, I want you guys to be able to memorize them. So here's what I want you to do. I'm challenging you right now. Look at the person next to you. You got 30 seconds. One of you figure out if you know all 10. Maybe the two of you together. See if you can get them. Ready, set, go. <laughs> I love it. Some of you aren't even trying. <laughs> You're like, just give me an F. I failed. Some of you are just kind of like going, is he serious? You expect us to learn 10 commandments? No one's sitting around you. Just say them to yourself. Got them out loud. You know them? Okay, honestly, how many of you got all 10? Any, anyone? Okay, I see a hand. I see two. All right, good. Starts off with that, that whole statement from God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And then he says the Ten Commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. You can say them with me. It's fine. D you know, do, you shall not make any graven images or idols. Do not take God's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. You guys rolling now? Honor your father and your mother. Right? Then, the, all the thou shalt nots, right? Do not commit murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not covet. That's right. See, you guys know them. You got to have more confidence. Say them every day while you're driving someplace. You'll get them down. Because uh, we want God's wisdom. This is God's wisdom to keep us from crashing our lives. That's why it's called the guardrails series. We don't want to crash. And today we're looking at Exodus 20, 14. It's a really long verse. It simply says, you shall not commit adultery. Got that? Anyone want to confess? No? Okay. So uh, then we'll just go on with the sermon. <laughs> See, everybody suddenly got really uncomfortable. We knew you were talking about this. It says it on the screen. It says it in the notes. I'm not going to make eye contact with the preacher tonight. Uh, we don't want to go there. See, God gave us this guardrail to keep our lives from cr crashing. He gave us this command to bless us, our marriages and our families, and he wants us to keep our lives and our families from crashing, to save us from the pain and destruction that comes with 
disobedience. And so this is a command, and, and, and really all of them, are for the people of God. So if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus actually is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, we've been singing songs about it, you believe that he was raised from the dead, and you have made a personal commitment, okay, to follow Jesus as your Savior and Lord, then this really applies to you. Now, if you're not a Jesus follower yet, and, and, you, and you obey what he says, it's still going to bless you. But if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then God gave us these guardrails in order to bless our lives. God wants to protect you and your family from the damage of adultery. Okay, the damage that comes from adultery. You break this command, and you will get hurt. Okay? Proverbs chapter 6, King Solomon is writing Proverbs to his uh, adult children, or really his teenage children, sons, trying to warn them about life and trying to give them some wisdom. And he says this, Can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned? Can he? No, okay, yeah, it's kind of obvious. Can, can someone walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? So is he who goes into his neighbor's wife. None who touches her will go unpunished. So is there anybody here, any guy here that wants to hold a burning log on his lap? No, I didn't, notice I didn't say any wives that want to put one on his lap. No, you don't want to hold it. You're like, no. Anybody actually want to walk on hot coals? I don't even want to walk to the trash can barefoot in June. Right? I mean, because it's like, I got tender feet. I'm not going to walk out there and ruin my feet. For, you know, not hot coals, definitely not. You see, the reality is this. Adultery is going to damage you. It's going to damage your spouse. It's going to damage your children. And even if your marriage survives, trust and intimacy will take a long time to rebuild. The crazy thing is, we all know this. We all know this. It's not something that's hidden from us. We see the effects of it all around us. Some of us have, have walked this road and, and, and felt the pain, and yet we still break the command. Why? Why do we willingly damage ourselves and our families through unfaithfulness? Let's talk about the decisions about adultery. Why would we do this? Why would we make this destructive decision? Why does God have to warn us from something that's so obviously painful? Uh, it begins by understanding that God is the one who blessed us with marriage and sex. Uh, if you're new to, to Calvary, I just want you to understand, sex is God's idea. He's the one who came up with it. He's the one who created us for it. He's the one who made it wonderful. And so he created us to enjoy intimacy in marriage, physically and emotionally. And if we follow God, if we listen to his wisdom, if we live our life according to his guardrails, marriage will be a blessing and a joy. But Satan is a liar. And Satan wants to destroy your marriage and he wants to kill your joy. And we know this because Jesus told us this. In the Gospel of John, Jesus is recorded as saying uh, these two things. He said, first of all, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. There's a contrast, Jesus' way, Satan's way. Satan is going to steal your life from you. He's going to kill your marriage. He's going to destroy your family. And then Jesus, in John chapter 8, said, Satan is the father of lies. He's been a liar from the beginning. He says he's a father of lies. In other words, Satan deceives us, and he, and he takes God's wonderful gift of sex, and he warps it. And he sells us on destruction and pain and garbage. And, and, and here's the thing. He makes it look fun and exciting and thrilling, and yet it always leads to pain and destruction and, and garbage. But Satan is an excellent salesman. And honestly... Most people are buying. So what I'm going to do is I just want to point out a couple of Satan's myths. Some of the lies that he's told us that we've kind of believed culturally, and, and, and when I say culture, I, I, don't, I don't mean that, that uh, you buy into the, you know, the images that are in our entertainment or our over-sexualized predatory culture. I'm talking about beneath that where we don't even think about 
things and their lies. And we just kind of have swallowed them and, and lived them. So here's a, here's a couple of myths that I hope you don't believe. And if you walked in believing, I hope you don't believe it when you walk out. Uh, the first myth is that person will make me happy. That person will make me happy. It doesn't matter if you think that person will make you happy for one night or for a lifetime. It is a lie. A person isn't going to make you happy. We hear this in myth statements like, uh, I found my soulmate. You complete me. Or in the negative, you don't make me happy anymore. See, those are all rooted in this myth that a person will make you happy. Let me just go ahead and tell you a very harsh truth. If you expect any person to make you happy, then you are going to be miserable your entire life. Okay, just let that sink in for a minute. If you expect a single person to make you happy, then you are committed to being miserable your entire life. You see, that's not how you're going to be happy. That's not possible for someone to do that. You see, happiness is your responsibility, not somebody else's responsibility. It's a you thing. It's not the job or the capability of any other person in the world to make you happy. I mean, it might be easier to choose to be happy around some than others, but that person can't make you happy. You see, joy is a result of surrendering your life to Jesus. Okay, that is produced in your life by surrendering to the Holy Spirit who's in you because that's the fruit that he bears in your life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Okay, you're going to find joy in loving and following and serving Jesus. That's reality. If you think that a person will make you happy or if you think they'll make you happier, guess what that is? That's idolatry because that's God's job not theirs. And by the way, if you feel that way towards somebody, oh, you're going to make me happy, you know what you're going to do? You're going to kill the relationship. You're just going to smother the life out of it. You're going to choke the life out of it because nobody can bear that responsibility for you. And at some point, you're going to kill that relationship because you put too much expectation on them. It's not their job. That person will make me happy is a lie from Satan. It'll destroy your life. Second myth, oh, I love this one. People just say, I fell out of love. I just fell out of love, you know. We fell into love, and then we fell out of love, and I just don't love you anymore. I, you know, and when you say, I fell in love, or I fell out of love, you're implying that you can't help it. And, and let me just confess to you, don't ever say these words to me, because when you say these words to me, I want to scream. I just want to yell. You know what I want to yell? I want to yell, that's a huge pile of spiritual garbage that Satan is selling. <laughs> Stop buying it. Right? You're making love sound like a swimming pool that you were walking by and you fell into it. Oh, look, I just actually fell in the pool. You make love seem like it's a pile of dog poop that you actually stepped in. Oh, I stepped in love. Look at that. I got it all over me. <laughs> no. Hey, let me just, just tell you a straight-up biblical truth. Love is a choice. Love is a choice. Falling out of love is a lie. The truth is, love is a choice. You choose to love, and you choose to stop loving. Now, I know that just saying those words is shocking to some of us who have bought the Hollywood lie about love. You just bought it. Oh, he fell into love. Oh, he fell out of love. You're my soulmate. No. Uh, and some of you are going, all right, preacher man, why do you think? Why in the world do you think that love is a choice? Why do you think that we have the ability to, to choose this? All right, I'm going to tell you. Here it is. It's a really easy answer. <laughs> Jesus. That's my answer. Because God tells us in his word repeatedly that love is a choice. You see, God doesn't command feelings. He doesn't command emotions. What does he command? actions he commands actions think about it jesus said the great commandment is to love the lord your god with all your heart soul mind and strength the second is like it love your neighbor as yourself do you always feel like loving your neighbor 
Now, you probably don't always feel like loving God, but you've been commanded to do that. Okay, and then Jesus takes it to a ridiculous level. Matthew chapter 5, he says, You've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. You want to be like God? You know what that means? Love your enemies. Are you ever going to feel like loving your enemies? You might feel like punching your enemies. You might feel like sabotaging your enemies. You might feel like avoiding your enemies. Are you ever going to feel like loving your enemies? No. Because love is a choice. It's not a feeling. It's a choice. It's a decision that you're making. How about this? 1 Corinthians 13, the Apostle Paul says, love is, do you guys know this? Love is patient and love is kind. Hey, can you fall into patience? I've never heard anyone go, I was just walking down the street, I just saw them and I fell in patience. I just had this overwhelming urge to be patient with those people driving slower in, in front of me. I had this overwhelming urge to be patient with the person who couldn't figure out how to use the, you know, the pay thing at the grocery store. Right? And we don't ever fall into patience. Why? It, because it's not a, God's not telling us that, that we're supposed to feel something. He's telling us to choose something. To love. To love your neighbor as yourself is a choice. To love somebody is a choice. So what about the feelings of love? What about the feelings you have towards somebody else? Even somebody who's not your spouse. What do you do with those? Well, feelings are real. Okay, and you're feeling attraction, and attractions are real. Okay, so let's go ahead and acknowledge that. You might be attracted to someone, and, and there's all kinds of reasons it might be. It might be lust. Okay, just call it out. It, it, it really might be. It, now, it might also be their personality. It might be they may, they're fun, and you're not, and you're drawn to that. Might be a need, you know, where you kind of like they're the opposite, you know, opposites attract. And so, so maybe you're really structured and rigid and they're spontaneous and that appeals to you. And you I, I need some spontaneity in my life. Or maybe they're decisive and you're indecisive. You're like, I need somebody to decide for me and I'm really drawn to that. Or maybe you're poor and they're rich and you're drawn to their money. I don't know. They, they, there's all kinds of reasons to be attracted to people, but that doesn't mean it's love. It means it's attraction, and you can call it that. Maybe you're attracted to them because of thrill and excitement and adventure or an ego boost. Lots of reasons we feel attraction. But life comes down to your decisions. Life comes down to your choices. Satan openly wants you to destroy your life and your family. God wants to bless you. He wants to bless your life. He wants to bless your family. See, God wants you to choose love. He wants you to choose faithfulness. He wants you to choose life. So how many of you want love and faithfulness in life for your family? Raise your hands. Oh, good. You raised your hands. That means I can talk about defending your family. Okay? Let's talk about protecting your marriage. Because your decisions that, that you make are going to bless or curse your family. So do you want to defend your family from destruction? Some of you do. That's good. So do you guys want to defend your family from destruction? Okay, good. Well, let me tell you how. Three simple things, and, and this applies to everybody, whether you're married or not, whether you're in a relationship or not. This is just things that we need to do if we're going to let God bless us and we're going to live according to his boundaries. First of all, guard your heart. Guard your heart. Proverbs chapter 4 Again, Solomon in his wisdom says, keep your heart with all vigilance. Guard your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Guard your heart. That, that means you have to choose every single day to love your spouse. Choose to love your spouse. You, you know what that means? It means you've got to ask God to help you love them better. Part of your prayer, if you're in a relationship, every day I'd be saying, God, help me to love my spouse better than I, I did today. Help me to love them the way you created me to love them. And thank you for giving them to me. See, when you're thanking God for them, you're not going to let that bitterness grow in there. And, and ask God to help you love them as they are, not as you wish they were. Yeah, see, a lot of us sacrifice the real relationship for the ideal one that's in our head that's never going to be. 
Ask God to help you love them in their sin because they're loving you in your sin. And forgive your spouse every single day. Consciously, continually offer up words of grace and actions of grace because you're not going to have any lasting love without mercy and forgiveness. And I just challenge you, pray for your spouse and pray with your spouse. Invite God into the relationship. Here's a, here's a key one. Pray that God would bless them and change you. Let me say it again so you hear this. Pray, ask God, I dare you, ask God to bless your spouse and change you. Because you know what our, our selfish prayer is? God bless me and change my spouse. There's a lot of us praying that. God bless me, change them, they're a mess. No, stop doing that. You pray, God uh, bless them and change me. And, and here's the thing, if you will let your spouse hear you praying for God to bless them, that'll change the dynamic of your relationship right there. But see, unless you're actively doing this, it, you're not guarding your heart. You've got to choose actively to love your spouse better. And then guard your mind. Guard your mind. Matthew chapter 5 Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. See, he's quoting Exodus. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus raised the bar. He said it's not just the physical that counts as adultery, it's the mental. It's the imagination. So if you want to be faithful... Stop checking out potential partners. I, I mean, let's just be real blunt about that. And I'm going to be really blunt, okay? You know another lie from the enemy? Satan loves this one. Well, just because I've already ordered doesn't mean I can't look at the menu. <laughs> yeah, some of you have said that, haven't you? You don't have to raise your hand now. You don't have to confess. I've heard that so many times. Uh, oh, just because I've ordered it. Yeah, you know, Jesus called that adultery. You figure out whether you can look at the menu or not, but I don't think he gives me that, that freedom and that reality. Um, and stop comparing your spouse to other people. You know, they're always going to lose that because you're not living with that other person. You don't really know their faults because I'm just going to tell you they're just as disgusting in the morning as your spouse is right now. <laughs> okay? I heard it put this way one time. And I'll put it in, this, in the way, of guys, you know that, guys, you, you think that woman that's perfect and everything like that, that you're going to, you know, leave your spouse for, and, and you're going to be happy. There's somewhere there's a guy who's praising God, she's no longer in his life. <laughs> See, you might think, oh, it's all good, but it's, stop comparing. By the way, that's judging. Jesus said, take the log out of your own eye before you try to take the speck out of your, your, somebody else's eye. Look in the mirror, see your faults, work on your faults, ask God to help you be the person you need to be. Stop comparing your spouse to others, and seriously, break the hold of pornography in your life. And I know right now some of you are pretending shock. <gasps> we're in church. What do you mean talk about pornography? There's, we, don't, we're, we love Jesus. We don't have an issue with pornography. Um, I am a scum-sucking pig sinner. And I know the evil that's in my heart. So I'm just going to put it this way. I think if you're only half as bad as I am, you're disgusting. Okay? Here's, here's the reality. And we can be really uncomfortable about this. We can pretend. But the, the reality is this. The surveys that are taken of church-going people who identify as Christians says that 60 to 70% of Christian men and 20% of Christian women struggle with pornography addiction addiction we're not talking about yeah i'm tempted sometimes I like we're talking about fighting it as a battle and losing the battle most of the time see some of you are going six out of ten that means i'm surrounded by perverts <laughs> yes you are okay let's just be honest about this you see, in the church, we pretended, and we covered it up, and we lie, and that doesn't get us anywhere. It doesn't get us honest before God. We need to be honest about who we are. We need to be honest about our struggles. Look, I don't want to fight that battle. I don't want to struggle with that. I thought it would go away when I got married. Guess what? It doesn't. Here's, here's a statistic that I made up. 95%, uh, I just tell you. 
I just made it up. 95% of guys struggle with lust, and the other 5% struggle with lying. Okay? It's just how I see it. Which is why I and, and most of the pastoral team has covenant eyes on, or some other accountability software on their phones, on their tablets, on their computers. We have accountability software, filtering software, and if you want information about that, it is in your bulletin. We gave you information, because you've got to pay for it. It's not free. I wish it was free. The free stuff didn't keep, keep up. But we pay for it so that we can have that accountability, so that we can protect our own hearts and our minds, because this is a serious battle, and we want our marriages to succeed. We want to be blessed. So guard your mind. Finally, guard your body. The Apostle Paul told his young protege, Timothy, flee youthful passions or lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Run away from it. Get away from it. From the temptation or the tempting circumstances. In other words, that means there's no such thing as a harmless flirting. There's no such thing as harmless flirting. Uh, ladies, are you dressing in a way that you want to catch men's attention? Or are you dressing in a way that says, not available? Look, we, are, we have eyes, we notice. I just be honest, we notice cleavage, we notice, you know, the hemlines, we notice. And, and a lot of us are trying not to notice. And, and, and so when you put yourself together, are you wanting to be noticed? See, I'm not going to give you standards of what modest, modesty is or isn't. You've got to figure that out, but you do have to look at your motives. And ladies, would you st please stop pointing out other women? Okay, this is, my wife is guilty of this. I rebuke her all the time. She's like, Jeff, look at that. And I look and I go, would you stop it? I am trying not to look. And you're telling me to look. This is not helping anything. And men, there's no excuse to ever visit a strip club. Because what happens in Vegas will soon be on Facebook and ruin your life. Okay? Look, we know the damage that adultery can do. You're aware of the decisions that you need to make. So what are you going to do? Seriously, what are you going to do? I want to share with you uh, a story. Uh, it's a testimony uh, given to me by a, a lady here at Calvary. It's anonymous. And you'll understand as I, as I share it, but it's her story of pain and redemption. She says, my husband and I had a perfect and beautiful beginning. We loved doing life and our marriage together. We were best friends. We loved the Lord, and without fail, we started every day praying together. In my mind, I had the picture-perfect, picket-fenced house dream along with two incredible children. We were involved in our church, community. We even led a marriage class. My husband and I had been married for over 30 years, and we felt safe and successful in our lives. But looking back, that success caused us to think that sin couldn't touch us. It was a blind deception, and we let down our defenses and guard. We put ourselves in situations and places deadly to our marriage. Our lives had gradually become dominated by our party lifestyle, and blindly, I still thought I was immune to sin. I thought I was free from danger, and I thought I was in control of every situation. I never set out to be an adulteress, but eventually I was enticed to believe that I was missing something satisfying in the world. It was enticing to believe that I could be more desired and become a fascinating woman. I thought that I wanted to seduce and have power over men, but soon the one affair turned into multiple affairs. And I found myself in a place I never dreamed I could be. In my determined selfishness, I listened to Satan's lies so much that I lived a life of lies and deception for years. The reality and the truth of my life was this. I had set fire to our sacred, cherished, and perfect house. 
as the flames spread, I was saying goodbye to everything good and honorable in my life. My picket fence dream house was burning down, and I couldn't stop it. I had deceived and betrayed my husband, the person I loved most. He was wounded and brokenhearted beyond anything I could have imagined. Our children were confused and devastated, and, and even my parents suffered as they grieved for the damaging mess I had created. I was miserable and had no self-respect. Mental anguish and shame consumed me. At that point, I decided to completely surrender my life to Jesus again and ask for his mercy. I desperately wanted everything to be like it was before this all began. I prayed that this nightmare would just end, but the poison of adultery and betrayal contaminated and infected our lives for over a decade. Now today, I praise God for Jesus' saving power. I praise God for redemption because it's been beautiful and God's mercy has been sweet, but I won't pretend it has been painless or simple. It's been an agonizingly long, challenging, and sometimes despairing road back. God's grace, God's compassion and forgiveness have embraced me from the beginning. And after, after several angry and brokenhearted years, my husband's willingness to forgive and pick up the pieces was more than I could ever deserve or ask for. But he did. The next part of the story is the best part of the story and of who God is is and what he can do but that's another happier chapter that's the part i'd love to tell you in another time in another place you see god can redeem your life and god can redeem your marriage and god can heal the hurts and god can restore but we've got to make the choice to love we've got to make the choice to let god redeem And that means that we take actions, actions like seeking out counseling, actions like going to celebrate recovery, actions like walking out of here and signing up for fight night. Yeah, the marriage night. See, it's practical and it's soon. But you've got to make the decision. And what we're going to do right now is we're going to give you an opportunity to have a conversation with God uh, about your life and about your faith and about your marriage. Uh, because Joseph is going to sing a song for you that he wrote. And he wrote this song as he watched a loved one's marriage implode. 